Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. Mass is the road of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, where in the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the road of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, where in the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the world of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, wherein the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Right. Well, any questions before we um, begin with the practice stitches and then 30 minutes of, of silent practice? Um, I was just going to say, it's not particularly a stitching question. It's more of a um, getting, you know, squaring it up, you know, kind of squaring up the rectangle so it's, um, you know, how to do that so it's accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had a way of doing that, didn't you? Where yeah, with the square, and um, I don't have a square with me today, but I can demonstrate the broad strokes uh, again um, with a piece of paper or something. I could certainly do that. Is that where you are now? Yeah, that's that's where I'm up to now. Okay. Um, then I can do that. Um, let me figure out how I would like to do that. I only have uh, I only have my my fabric shears with me today, so I'm not going to be cutting any paper. So I have to make do with the paper I have. Um, so basically, the process would be an uncut piece of paper. I'll use basic sewing instructions. So the first thing to do is to kind of just take a survey of all of the corners that are on the, uh, that are, that are sewn. And look for a corner that already looks pretty square. They all should be square because it's just a single piece, but um, that already, that where that line already looks fairly straight. And it can be either the line the long line across already looks pretty straight, or the line along the edge already looks pretty straight. Pick one that does look fairly straight already. And then choose, so I'm gonna, uh, for this example, I'm going to use this top stitch here. So place your square aligning with that, uh, that straight edge that you've chosen. And then move it into the corner. I'm using this corner here as my, my square corner. Move it into your corner and align it. Mark your chosen straight line. In this case, my long stitch. Mark that one first because that's going to be your um, source of truth for all of your squaring. That's going to be the best point of reference if you're trying to measure off of it, if you're trying to move the square in a you know, way that makes sense. You want to have 
in you want to know in your own mind which of these four edges is your straight edge. So mark that one first. And then since the square is already in position, mark that second edge for, um, and then you'll know that these two are 90 degrees perpendicular guaranteed. And so that one, then this one for me, but then for you, it could be reversed. Then you will move the square around and gradually work your way uh, until you have done, you have checked that all four corners are square and redrawn a line on all four edges. When you're finished, let me see if I can get the whole width then. And this short edge, let's see, can I see both fingers? Yeah, close enough. Um, you will want to measure that all four are pretty close, all four lengths. Um, so they should match their, their partner. So this, these two long edges should be within probably two millimeters of each other. And likewise, the two short edges should be within two millimeters in length of each other. And that way you will know if, if they are all within 0.2 millimeters of length with each other, you will know that they are square or pretty darn close. Great, thank you. And Lynn, you had a question before we begin? I'm uh, uh, now sewing the face to the frame um, and I just wanted to check with you. Um, I'm assuming that I'm doing it in a, a contrasting thread. Yes, yes. Um, the thread you use on your face. And, and is there um, a, a starting point do you do you have a you know do you have a suggestion about where you start or does it not matter thank you for asking um so there is not a particular corner that is best to start in no um has have Anne or i gone through the knotless start and knotless finish for the group yet no, 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 I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I think it's something I've done before where you do sort of two or three, you do three stitches all in the same place and then move on. Yes, yeah. Well, you, uh, could, you could demonstrate it, that would be lovely. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, there is, um, there's kind of the two options, you can either do it um, in the exact same place or you can actually go back and forth just like you would with a sewing machine. Uh, Sewing in place is probably similar, or, or, or sorry, simpler. So we can begin there. And get started and remember not to knot it because that is the whole purpose of this practice of this particular stitch. So I'm just going to thread my needle. Let's pretend that this is the edge of my rakasu uh, where it meets the face. And just ignore the fact that I'm going to be going in so deeply. For you, this would actually be quite near that edge. But I'm going to try to sneak my needle in so that it first comes out where you want it to um, by sneaking it under that edge of the frame. And so you'll have your thread come up wherever you need to start. But the, the key is to start it by, snip, like by sneaking under the frame. Yeah. Then leave a tail, a visible tail, and we're going to do, we're going to pull that under tension and cut it under tension uh, in a bit. Then simply do your stitch. And the problem, one of the challenges with doing it, um, doing it here is that you cannot go all the way through, as I'm sure you've read, Lynn. In the yeah. instructions that you're going to just be trying to catch just the face and the frame and maybe also the um maybe also please not to hear from any anymore uh so yeah so um you want to just try to catch those two layers and you can come back right up where you your first stitch came up that is one option yeah or you can sew two or three stitches in one direction first, I think. 
this might be something that Ann and I want to align on, on which guidance we want to suggest um, on whether we want to have it just the first stitch or if we want to suggest doing it through multiple, whatever the case is on the last stitch, just kind of do the loop where you are going to pass the needle under the thread only, not through the fabric, just to, to put in a quick loop. In my personal experimentation, about three stitches is the last, at four stitches, it starts to become noticeable on the finished garment. Okay. And um, because the back is not visible on these, you can do whatever you want to get to the next stitch. So you can go directly from, um, how have I gotten out? Oh, okay. Um, so you can just go directly through to the next stitch. I think that will work here fine. You know, I think this is actually the, the, the best guidance. I think using the single stitch method is probably going to be the simplest to teach and communicate remotely. So I think this that I just demonstrated should be um, what everyone tries to do. Okay. So what okay. I did, oh, and I need to finish it. I'm sorry, and one more, one final step. So we've got this tail that will still be visible at the face. Yeah. Going to pull, um, you're going to actually displace the fabric of the, the face a little bit and just cut it so that when that tension releases, this is shorter than that edge. There's so much thread here that it's kind of kind of quite a mess. But you can see that this cannot extend beyond that edge because I have cut it shorter. Right. Right. Yep. Okay. I, I, I'll have, I think I'll probably have a practice before I do it on the rack. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I trust Lynn that you'll be able to, to make something with your experience. Um, was that clear enough for, for everyone here? How I did, how I rationalized and how I, I did that? So I can do it again now that the decision has been made. In fact, why don't I just do that? John? Yes. The only question that I have is around the terminology that you were using. Sure. The, what? Sti the single stitch versus the triple stitch, I think. I think you've lost me there. So what I meant there, hmm, that tension method may not work super well this way. We may want to do another trick. Um, what I meant was, so by doing a single stitch here, you did all of the, you just did three stitches in one place. So it was a single stitches worth of distance that you traveled. The triple stitch method, you actually would sew this like a normal first stitch. You would sew a second stitch as normal, a third stitch as normal. And then you would basically just with a single, like a single um, thread of the uh, media fabric of this blue fabric, you would begin reversing. So you would sew those three stitches in reverse, reverse it yet again, and then do the, the full length, oh. similar to um, reversing a sewing machine. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's what you would do in a sewing machine, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it, but it becomes a little less feasible um, when you're hand sewing. There's some difficulty with the reversing step. I've had, well, there have been people in the past who have not been able to translate guidance into to doing it so so easily. Um, both people who um, had fine vision and fine hands, and people who had concerns with one or the or both. So what I'm doing, I've already stitched. I stitched the first stitch, uh, and then I came out instead of coming out one you know, where the next stitch would come out. I came out where that first stitch started. I'm gonna pull that tight again. I'm going to do the same thing one more time where I go in as normal, but come out where I began. And then, and then for the final stitch, for the final go round, I'm looping under, I'm passing my needle beneath the, 
I'm going to pass the needle under my sewing thread just to get a loop in there. And that will help secure this, that it will, uh, the friction of the fabric and the friction of the threads against each other will help keep this uh, in place nigh indefinitely. Uh, again, I've mentioned this before, but this is not a sport garment. This is going to be going to be worn for a fairly uh, stationary practice. <laughs> you crack me up. <laughs> well, thank you. And there you go. And then to finish, so this is much closer to what you would see in real life. You could probably just sneak your scissors, the, just the tip of your, your scissors under that edge and cut it. Uh, oops, I did the poor job of demonstrating that. Maybe turn it so that I can actually see and get under. Maybe do that. And then even if the loose end does get sucked into the fabric, it won't be, be visible uh, in the finished garment. That's great, thank you. Yet another option, but I'm not going to confound uh, too, too much. <laughs> Don't confuse me anymore. Well, <laughs> thank you, John. You're welcome. I, I guess I could briefly demonstrate that. The only perhaps I should just demonstrate. And I'll go um, beginning to end. Uh, so I'm going to go in from a distance. I'm going to come up where I intend to start my line of, of stitches. Oh, and I've already sucked it in. And that's okay. I think that that, again, because we have these three stitches, the friction will hold everything in place. We don't need to, to have it um, buried under tension, which is more of a finishing technique anyways. So I've done one stitch. Done two stitch, perhaps. All in the same place, coming out in more or less the, the same spot each time and going in the same spot. Now that I have two, I'm going to pass my needle under only the sewing thread, both, both threads of it, to make a loop to help the sewing thread hold there its peers in place with, fric with friction that it does not ravel. And then you can begin sewing in earnest. I'm gonna sew two stitches. These can be my practice stitches. And then I will demonstrate finishing, which is the same practice, but it does have the burying under tension step, which I will demonstrate. This will be my finishing stitch. Again, I'm going to come out where the stitch is beginning because I intend this to be the last. Mm. Sweaty hands. And oh, this is already two, so I'm going to go under the sewing thread with my needle, creating a loop for additional friction. Uh, and straighten that out too, so it's not a very visible loop. Try to just pull it in the direction of the stitch to straighten that loop. What am I doing here? Okay, so now I am burying. Um, so I've got, this is a total of three, this will be a total of three passes around this section two, then a loop. And to finish the third, I'm going to insert my needle and come out somewhere else in the fabric. I often go about the entire length of the needle. For this demonstration, I'm doing shorter, not to cause myself too much of a headache. So pull it and then pull it tight that it actually slightly, well, I'm trying to get my fingers in it. 
to where it actually slightly deforms the fabric, but not so much that the deformation would be permanent. And then put a finger down to hold that tension. So uh, that deformation of that, that fabric where the edge kind of dipped in because I pulled it should still be there under my finger, even though we cannot see it. And then nip your, your thread as near to the fabric as you are comfortable without, of course, damaging it. And then you see when I pull this thread tight again, it just gets sucked wow. right in. Wow, right Yeah. So that is how, um, and that, that's, that step is important for finishing more than it is for starting. Well, I like that. Uh, thank you. That's very, very tidy. Well, thank you. Thank you. So that should help. Um, you're going to use that all on the, the face and also for the, uh, the squares.
um, doing some quick instruction on the frame again, both a refresher on um, marking and measuring, and then also uh, getting to the uh, the frame piece itself and the, the pinning uh, and how you work around the frame. Probably just large images. Uh, so when you have your piece of fabric and it's time for you to mark your uh, mark and measure your frame and you have um, you you've just finished the squaring step that Maria asked about uh, and just attached your um, silk and interfacing to your face. So that's the step that you've come to using the, the fabric that we've sent for this purpose. So you're going to try to find one of your edges. Um, some of you may have selvage, and if you do, um, you can use that selvage as an edge. If you notice during our silence, I was actually, um, I was fortunate enough to have selvage here. You can actually still see the machine needle marks or whatever. Um, and I cut that off. So you can use that as an edge. If you don't have selvage, go ahead and give yourself about a, nut and a centimeter away from the edge that we've given you and straighten your fabric as best you can. Um, if your eyes are, are good enough, you can even try to see if the thread or if the, uh, try to you know, see if the threads themselves are relatively straight. My eyes aren't that good anymore, but um, some of y'all may have, have uh, magnification tools or something and you might have the interest. Otherwise, just um, see if it feels straight. By that, I mean the fabric wants to stay in place. It doesn't want to twist or curl on you or anything like that. And then uh, using a straight edge tool, uh, if you have a full, anything longer than a meter, uh, that would be ideal. These tend to run about 120 to 125 centimeters, if I'm remembering right. No, maybe uh, just 110. Um, I'm not exactly certain. I could. Oh, 120. Mine ran a 121.9. Um, so if you have something longer than a meter, use that. If not, um, you will need to, to pick up and move the, the measuring tool. First, you're going to mark your straight edge uh, for the finished length of your uh, frame. And if you remember, we discussed that that was based on your measurements. So you determine the length of your frame by first measuring the length of your top piece, sides, bottom, side, and then you're going to do one plus 4.2 is 5.2, plus 27.0 is 32.2, plus 8.4 is 40.6, all the way down, summing each of the numbers below this line and marking the, the running total on top of the line. And at the end, you'll get your finished length, which again, for me is 121.9. Oh, come on, focus. Close enough. Um, so it's my finish length is 121.9. So I'm going to try to establish that line. Um, when you're uh, needing to move a ruler, some people will mark outside of the distance where a reference point is and then add to that the requisite amount. So let's assume this is my 121.9. Once you have that straight line, you're going to use a square to measure the uh, nine, 10.4 length for the length of the sides using the square. So that you wanna be really careful to make sure that these edges are perfectly square and do it on both ends. So you've got both ends uh, square at 10.4. And uh, at this point, you want to, um, also measure 10.4 somewhere in the middle and also mark the seam allowances. So let's assume this is my 10.4 and this is the one centimeter seam allowance on each side. Next, we're going to measure this entire length on the outside. Um, and I missed, I meant to, so when you're measuring these sides, also mark your seam allowances here too. So you'll want to mark the 10.4 distance. You'll want to mark the, uh, and then the one, 
4.2. You actually don't need to do the 4.2s yet, but you'll need the seam allowances. So do that, mark it on both ends and use your ruler along the, with the three seam allowance lines you, you've marked. Try to find kind of the average of the three. So this one you can see is much further, much higher. So I'm going to try to do somewhere in between. Draw that seam allowance. And this is actually where, when you have your straight edge along these, these seam allowances, we want to measure all of these mark these marks here. And I'm gonna to switch to the finished piece now. So if you're confident you know how to mark, this is kind of where you might wanna start, um, start listening. So, You can see here that where I have marked, I have marked uh, inside the just inside the seam allowance, where uh, that and that's where you're you're going to want to mark each of your distances, because if you recall on this guidance, your distance is marking x's that begin inside the seam allowance. So that's the edge of the cut, that's the cut edge on the farthest outside. Then you have seam allowance and that's where the x's are beginning. So when you are marking these 56.7 and 65.1 lengths, do them in the seam allowance. That way you don't have to go all the way to the edge with some sort of guessing game and trying to you know screw up your eyes to, to, to just be able to see that. And that will help you when you're marking these X's where um, you will have a clearer and simple, simpler way to mark out these X's. And uh, I recommend doing that before you cut it as well. It's just kind of easier to, to, while you're in a marking mood, so to speak, to do all of your marking. Do all of your pencil marking first, marking all of your seam allowances, all of your lines, and then go back through with a hair up um, Hera will be used for uh, this seam allowance, this seam allowance, and each of the X lines, you can see when I flip the garment, that's the purpose of the Hera. The Hera helps us see where our lines are when we are not looking directly at the lines. The first step of, uh, of pinning this frame are all done with this wrong side facing uh, facing us. So it's important or, or useful, helpful to a, you have that visible when aligning pins and making folds and whatever else. Once you have marked everything, you have your exterior cut lines, you have your seam allowances on all four sides, and you have these. And if you are using a Hera, you have marked them with the Hera. Um, I have done it without a hair. Uh, is is worth mentioning if you have not acquired one and don't intend to. That is okay. Um, they are they are a help, but they are not a requirement. Once you've done all that, cut along your cut edges. So next, I'm going to explain um, the pinning and just see if we can get a natural stopping point for me to address Marla's question while narrating this. I. I know that a lot of you aren't here yet, but um, I think Maria is demonstrating for us how useful it is to have continuous sections of explanation in the video that we can point to as kind of that section of the instructions where it lives in video. So I think I'm going to try to get through the reasonable part of the guidance for pinning the frame. So I'm going to begin with the instructions uh, in section four, frame, um, under frame construction. So the first step is to place the two ends of the frame together with chalk marks inside. So we're looking at that wrong side of the fabric. I think I lose track of the wrong side and right side. Sometimes it does use that language in the instructions, but we don't. Uh, we don't actually bother adhering to it much with this particular fabric since it's so, so plain. 
on both sides. So the instruction says, uh, a Hera V will be visible uh, on both sides, which we see that it is. And we will be pinning exactly line to line. If you remember earlier, we did give an option that you could pin the face pieces, not line to line, that you could pin them with the uh, a fold allowance in. And this time, if, if you did do that, do not do it this time. I usually do my pinning line to line by just barely inserting on one side and reversing and checking. Looks like I got pretty, pretty good on this first go. And then I will do most of the in inserting, most of the distance. And I'll flip and I'll actually insert looking at my line on the back and then flip and see how well I did. And again, pretty good, pretty good. That's a good sign that this line is probably going to be an easy one for me. Looks like that one was less accurate, so I'm going to redo it. What I do if I'm off on the back, but the right of the front, I know I'm good on. I will just barely back the, the pin out and just slide that back fabric. And ideally never remove the pin all the way from the front. You can use the shape of the fabric to see where that pin is wanting to come out, which I've done there. When I have done what I talked about, where you've backed out, that one got kind of messed up. I'm gonna redo it. I'll try to find a, another time to explain what I was about to say. What I'm doing right now is I'm trying to see visually why these are not aligning very cleanly. When I peel this back, you can see that they're, um, they, they don't sit exactly on top of each other. This top piece is a little bit this direction. This bottom piece is a little bit this direction. Was it a marking error? Was it a measuring error? And then how should I try to reconcile it? because it depends on how it's misaligned and why it's misaligned and or will determine how I address it. Looks like, I think what I'm going to do is try to split the difference and use this top piece looks more reliable. So I'm gonna just try to do my best to keep the same distance on the back from the chalk line, use it be parallel to it as opposed to exactly on it. Because it does appear to be sloppy measuring on that backside marking. And it looks like the same distance parallel on the back all the way through. I'm gonna do a quick check of my work going through that 
hairline. Yeah, and it came right out on the hairline on the back. So I'm going to trust that that uh, splitting the difference worked okay there. So that is that first step. So next, you uh, the, the instructions it says going along the frame. You're going to actually kind of pull the frame towards you as though it were. It's a, it's at this point it is a belt. You're going to pull it as though it is a belt on the pulley. The pulley being uh, your hands. You're going to come until you get to the next X line. This process is entirely reversible. It does not matter which direction you're going. Uh, from this corner, um, you will. It, it, the, 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 the instructions are completely reversible. It will make a difference at a future time. We will define a front and a back. Now I will make sure to call out when that is. So uh, we're going to make the X into a V by folding on with that center of the X as best we can. Lining edges of the fabric. And you're going to do this on all four of our X's. And again, this section, uh, there is uh, every step, every part of this step is reversible. Uh, meaning you can go, you can turn the belt, the fabric either direction, uh, and you can pin on, on either side to your comfort. Later though, there will be a point to be more vigilant. I mentioned that this can be done without a Hera. To do it without a Hera, you will need to be to, to be pulling the fabric apart a lot, um, which requires good, strong chalk lines and fairly strong vision. So uh, if you have the, the Hera, it is worth the time to use it. They're kind of tricky to use though. So I'm on to my last one, I believe, yep. This is my last X.
Okay, here's a good example of what I wanted to talk about briefly. Um, so this is pretty, I've got the, the fabric pretty much uh, flat with the, uh, uh, or parallel to the table beneath it. And you can see from this uh, neat, this pin that it is not going in perpendicularly to the fabric. And that is because on the back, when I pulled um, the back out, uh, or when I backed the, the pin out just enough to re make sure it comes out in the correct place on the back, well, you can see the fabric itself is not yet aligned for, but you can easily tell, you can easily align it by using the needle almost like a, I don't know, a sundial or it's an indicator. You pull the fabric until the needle does become perpendicular so that you know that the, the hole in the fabric on the back and the hole in the fabric on the front are aligned by making that pin perpendicular. That's just a simple tool to help um, when you're easing fabric or what have you to know that you've done a fair job of, of trying to align things. So this one is badly aligned, so I'm going to need to do that same. And it's not coming out perpendicularly. Just gently moving thread by thread, kind of just rolling the fabric between my fingers in the right direction, aligning the bottom and top piece. Okay, so I have got one, two, three, four side or four pin. And just because it was the way that they were in the photos, um, I've chosen to uh, start with the edges where they meet on top and then pull toward me on the pinning, but it is optional. Uh, and not, it uh, doesn't make a huge difference at this phase, which you do first. I want to see if I can get uh, to the dog ear section. Is it possible to see the whole thing? Maybe, let's see. <clears throat> Just sort of get an overview. Put the camera at a real, Oh, there's Marla. I see Marla, your email. I'll try to get to that. But it looks like the next step, I'm going to have to do some running stitches before doing the next step. So this is the, the full thing. And if I kind of pull it, you can see that it becomes that, uh, uh, that, loop, that full loop of fabric. Well, actually, so that you don't, the camera's at a strange angle. Let me move to Ah, right, yeah, that's helpful just to get that image of it, isn't it? To, yeah. 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 And then you'll, this is still inside out from the way that it will finally be. Um, let me switch back to the camera. So, next, the next step is I'm going to do a uh, running stitch in matching thread along here and along here, about, according to the instructions, about two millimeters 
uh, from, oh, keeping track of the camera. Trying to just do it within two millimeters. So I'm gonna do a running stitch right where my thumbnail is along and then have a come out. I'll have to just demonstrate it. And in fact, I think I might demonstrate it in white thread uh, to help communicate it. And I don't think this week, let's see if we'll see if we have time. I'd like to get to Marla's question. Oh, Marla, no, this is perfect. This is perfect. So you have, um, this looks good. So what you're going to do, let me demonstrate the, the motion find the reference piece. So what you're, the, the piece that you were trying to fold is not actually the piece that um, you're going to be folding. So you were looking at this little seam allowance piece here. Yes. And you, it, it ends up getting folded, but we're not going to try to fold it on its own. So take, uh, so you're looking at the A piece on top. And um, I'm using five because it's the mirror image of one. Right. So begin, pull up on five and like a, like you're opening a book between these two, pull it so you can see the lines of five B, just pull five B under five A. Okay. Like so, and you should see, be able to see continuous lines on A and B. And that seam allowance on the back uh, in your photos, it may be short, it may be struggling back there, but it's okay um, because you'll also have the strength of this fold on the B piece, holding it all in place, holding it all um, where it belongs. And so you'll do this. I recommend taking, uh, now's a good time to press it. I recommend taking your iron and starting from, this is the A side here, uh, take your iron from the A side and kind of gently, very gently run it to the left to kind of sort of stretch that, you know, kind of expose those, those stitches like you can see with the, the staples there in the yeah. paper. Just very gently run your, uh, press it by running it from A to B and then gradually begin to apply more pressure to, to firm down that, uh, that B seam. Then flip and then you will fold that seam allowance. So this oh, is- the big the, one. Yes, yes, <laughs> on that first line. <laughs> Great, so that was that the, the piece that was missing? That was that the, the step that- Oh, yes. Out? I was okay. thinking, how on earth am I going to so fold that teeny tiny little piece twice and sew it down? Okay, that's yeah. wonderful, wonderful news. Yes. So you're okay. ready for, for this step, uh, folding the B under and then okay. folding under this first line of A under and then sewing that. Okay. Of course. So I don't think I'm gonna have time to demonstrate the running stitch. There is one special caveat about the running stitch on the frame. So we're gonna to have to do that on another video if we want me to be the demo for that. Um, and may get to it first. You have to keep the thread loose here at the, the point of the V uh, to allow you to invert it, which isn't hard. I think most folks could get through it without too much headache, maybe just one mess up. Um, hmm. I'll leave this where it currently is until next time. Great. Thanks for showing, showing us that. That's going to be really helpful. Yeah. If the, your link tree and, and kind of index of timestamps, I think that's going to be valuable. And for as an instructor to have a time or to, to have it as a continuous explanation um, is valuable. It just looks impossible on paper, but when you see it being demonstrated, kind of begin to get my head around it more. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. 
there was, I mean, frankly, the Namo Kibutsu stitch uh, at first was like that for me, even with that um, one support document. Mm. You wouldn't think it'd be so hard just to make a perfect rectangle, would you? <laughs> you mean, ah. well, fabric ah. likes, fabric is closer to water than it is to paper. Isn't yeah. it? I didn't realize until I was doing this. It's yeah. so true. It's a good way of putting it. Gosh, and there's some knits, some knit fabrics out there that, that I mean, I just look at them. I look at their demonstration photos of how they, they move. Uh, a lot of times you'll find fabric sold where they've taken their fingers and twisted the, the fabric around to show the way that it naturally wants to, to fold in on itself or twist or, or bend. And sometimes I just get nervous looking at those photos. There's, it's just fabric, but it looks, it looks like a dragon trying to writhe off the paper. <laughs> the photo. And it's trusting yourself as well, isn't it? Trusting that I have made a perfect rect rectangle that's good enough. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And checking and rechecking and checking again. And that's why I think it's helpful. I hope that it's helpful to have that two millimeter guidance. That if it's more than two millimeters, um, yeah, maybe you could check again. But otherwise, I think the instructions say it has to be perfect, perfect, perfect. But um, so it matters because that is how um, it is how the 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 steps and the care that I'm doing in the frame now will translate how neatly the seam allowance of the frame matches the seam allowance of the face. And so um, there's always some easing done when you're connecting the face to the, to the uh, frame, but hopefully not too much because you're within that two millimeters. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to kind of orchestrating this frame. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, the frame is really, I think, where the most devotional practice occurs because um, it's easy for me, at least, to get very task oriented with these shorter lengths. Like that only takes me maybe 10 to 15 minutes if I'm being slow, diligent, careful, probably less. And so I'm, I'm staying in kind of this task mode of, okay, I'm starting with a, a knot. I'm finishing with a knot, you know, it's A, B, C, even these longer pieces, they're not a huge amount of time, but when you're doing the frame, it is a long section of, you, you do this length three times, three times, and that, you, you, it really becomes devotional at some point. <laughs> Yeah, I think Lynn knows all about that because Lynn's, uh, <laughs> you've done that, haven't you, Lynn? <laughs> fun, no, it's fun. I've there's a reason I volunteered to to teach to to look into shoring up the instructions. It's because I find value in, in the practice and enjoy it. Mm. Thank you for doing it, John. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. me too. I think it'd be impossible for me to do this without guidance. <laughs> yeah, you're a great teacher, John. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for saying that. Mm. Very and clear. Glad. You're very clear. Well, thank you. I'm glad for uh, for Anne too. She helps keep me on the straight and narrow and from getting too lost in the details and too lost in unimportant nonsense. Uh, She's the reason the classes occur every week. Uh, so I, I have to give her a lot of credit for that. I think I make a better assistant teacher than I do. Uh, grand Poobah. It sounds like you balance each other out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We do a couple of other things together there on site. And um, we bring different things to the table for sure. Thank you very much for this experience. I enjoy being with you. Thank 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 you.
Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you so much. See you all next week. Well, actually, well, I'll be in the Zendorf. Bye. See you next week. Bye bye.